Got a report from the correspondents on the WASP who will be uh, giving us that play-by-play uh, -play description of the return as we watch it too with our live television cameras there. The cameras which on Thursday showed us so clearly that spacecraft bobbing in the water, the helicopters working overhead, the uh, uh, frog men working alongside and then finally that exciting moment when the hatch opened aboard the carrier deck and we saw Wally Shira give the thumbs up signal and that great big smile of his that filled our screens and filled our hearts uh, with joy, thrill and excitement. Whether we're going to get a similar picture of a spacecraft being opened and uh, two tired astronauts uh, coming out today seems a little bit doubtful. They may come back by helicopter from the bobbing spacecraft. Now here's Paul Haney in Houston. 29 hours, 46 minutes into the flight. And at this time, the uh, surgeon here in Houston is talking to the surgeon aboard the WASP, Dr. Charles Berry here in Houston in conversation with Dr. Minners bringing the Dr. Minners up to date on their physical status. He's advised that the command pilot, Frank Borman, yesterday consumed 4.6 pounds of water. He's had one pound of water to drink this morning. Jim Lovell, he says, has had 5.2 pounds of water yesterday, and he, too, drank one pound of water so far this morning. There's been discussion back and forth with the crew this morning on the subject of whether they were going to take a dexedrine stimulant before retrofire. The Houston surgeon here assumes they did not take any dexedrine. It had been uh, debated both ways. The Canton Island station is due to acquire seven at, at 26 minutes after the hour, 26 minutes and 40 seconds, and that station should monitor through the retro fire maneuver, which is to occur at a little more than 28 minutes after the hour. This is Gemini Control, Houston. And Gemini 7 goes winging along on its 206th and last revolution of the Earth. CBS News color coverage of Project Gemini resumes in a moment. So these two 35-year-old pilots are practically on the way home. They're on their last lap of those 206 they've made of the Earth. Incidentally, in the number of solar days they've seen, the fact that they've seen a sunrise and a sunset every 90 minutes, it might be calculated that they're six months and 26 days older than they were when they took off just two weeks ago. On the other hand, one of our mathematicians applying Einstein's theory of relativity says that actually they're one millisecond younger than they were when they took off two weeks ago. That part I couldn't possibly confirm. Mike Wallace is with Admiral Don White, the commander of past recovery forces, and has some morning information for us. Mike? Well, Walter, as Dallas Townsend said aboard the WASP, the latest report, the weather report from there, indicates scattered clouds about 2,000 feet, visibility 10 miles, winds are westerly at 12 knots, the seas are about 3 feet, which means it's a perfect day once again for recovery, just about as good as the last time. The temperature forecast for the recovery area, about 75 degrees. Now then, uh, the aircraft carrier WASP is at 25 degrees, 23 minutes north, and 70 degrees west, just aft of the, uh, just off its stern, is the destroyer Waldron, a plane guard, and then about 150 miles off the point of impact is the destroyer Power. The Power was steaming at the end of a cruise on its way back home, and they decided as long as they were out there, they'd have a little extra insurance. Most of the rest of the ships, though, have gone, uh, have gone back to port. The Wasp, the Waldron, and the Power are the three main operatives out there. They are 600 miles south-southwest of Bermuda and about 680 miles east-southeast of Cape Kennedy. Now, Admiral White, back in uh, GT3 with Grissom and Young, would you come on in, sir? Admiral White was the fellow who was in charge of the whole recovery operation back in GT3 with Grissom and Young and GT5 with Cooper and Conrad. I think that, uh, I think Admiral White what a lot of people would like to know, particularly following the recovery a couple of days ago, is 
how it is possible for the WASP not really to know where that spacecraft has come down with all of the radar equipment, the various planes, the various information that is fed to the WASP, it seemed as though there was some bewilderment out there as to just where Sharon and Stafford were in the water. Well, I don't think you'd call it bewilderment, Mike. Uh, undoubtedly, the WASP knew exactly where she was. Uh, now, as soon as the spacecraft is picked up on the radar, which occurred in this case, it could be as much as two or three hundred miles out, and the spacecraft is still traveling at a very high speed. As soon as it starts slowing down on the radar screen, you know aboard ship that you're approaching the point where the, where the angle will be almost vertical. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're getting down to where the main chute will open, and the, and the uh, spacecraft will then uh, pretty much come down in a vertical track. At some point in here, you're going to lose him on the radar. Why do you lose him on the radar? Because well, he can go into a fade, as it's called, or he can go into a so-called cone where there's no radar return, and you predict where he's going to be. Now, this, again, is dependent on the wind and many other things. Now, actually, as I understand the case the other day in Gemini 6, uh, the initial prediction was that the spacecraft would be to the west when it hit the water west of the carrier. Right. Now, I think from the reconstruction, it actually turns out it was neither east nor west, but almost due south, some 13 miles. And there was a report circulated by NASA, I believe, to the effect that the carrier had picked up a blip from a helicopter rather than the spacecraft and had fixed on the helicopter and didn't get the correction until the spacecraft was already in the water. What do you know about that? I don't know anything. I could only conjecture, and I'd say this is certainly a possibility once the spacecraft is either very close to the water or in the water. The helicopters are flying pretty low, and uh, of course the spacecraft no longer has its tremendous rate of speed, which is what distinguishes it from any other blip on the radar scope. Of course. Once it's slowed down so that it's uh, practically motionless, uh, from a planned view, it's very difficult to distinguish it from anything else. So there may be, it's conceivable, there could be as many as eight or nine blips uh, right out there on that screen, and it would be difficult to distinguish one from the other. Yes, except that most of them you could eliminate. They will be in some other direction from where you know the spacecraft must be. <clears throat> but the helicopters could be hovering and therefore yes, could be mistaken. Yes, As a matter of fact, if the, if the uh, spacecraft is at some distance from the carrier, uh, once it's in the water, the only blip you can get on the ship's radar is the helo that's uh, hovering right, right over it. it. Well, Walter, that uh, goes some distance to clear up the mystery of what happened last time around and why Wally Shara and Tom Stafford were due south, and some people thought they were west, and some people thought that they were east. Well, the one thing that was important was they came down far closer to the target point than any other Gemini has so far and uh, seemed to finally, with all the systems aboard, the computer, the radar, and so forth functioning, uh, this Gemini spacecraft can be fairly well aimed at its landing point, uh, which uh, had not been proved out in earlier Gemini flights when some component or another failed. Incidentally, we were saying a little while ago that uh, Elliot C., uh, one of the astronauts who is the uh, space communicator uh, during this flight, during one of the shifts at Houston, uh, a little while ago told Borman and Lovell to be prepared for a little jolt uh, right after main chute uh, deployment that uh, Gemini 6 had gotten quite a jolt. And if you remember back in Gemini 3, the Gus Grissom flight, uh, there was uh, such a severe uh, jolt that uh, the, uh, the Grissom and his pilot uh, both uh, hit their, uh, their uh, helmets, uh, their heads, on part of the spacecraft and even uh, opened up a little hole in Grissom's spacecraft visor. What happens, uh, that, that jolt comes at a point when the spacecraft coming down in this uh, position here, straight down, and the main chute has deployed out the top here, it suddenly is turned on its side in this fashion. Instead of landing in the water like this, which the Mercury capsules did, it lands the spacecraft on its side in the water. So it'll be floating immediately and bobbing upright, uh, even as a boat would with the uh, pilots uh, sitting at the top of it here. Uh, that's done by a 
triangular uh, shaped uh, gear that ties this to the main chute. And when that thing deploys and drops it like this, that's when the terrible jolt comes. Here's Paul Haney in Houston for Retrofire. Retrofire's due in a minute and a half. And uh, we're waiting to hear from Paul Haney. Well, we're not getting uh, mission control. We got word that they were coming up, but uh, they haven't as yet. Uh, Retrofire is now just a minute and a half away with the spacecraft, as you can see on our Colesman map there, uh, approaching uh, the Canton Island Station, uh, the tracking station there, which will be in touch uh, with the spacecraft as Retrofire sequence goes through. These men are now positioning uh, the spacecraft, getting it aligned right in that precise point pitched up in the right way, facing the right direction at the right uh, speed for their retrofire rockets to be set off for landing back here. here let's listen for Houston now. This is Gemini Control Houston. Canton Island acquired the spacecraft about 30 seconds ago. And Elliot C. has established voice communications with Frank Borman. He advised that he has cleared for retrofire. Canton Island should hold the spacecraft in uh, contact for some seven to eight minutes. And there'll be a two to three minute gap between there and Hawaii. Hawaii should hold them for five to six minutes. Simulator shows the dropping away Ten, of the nine, equipment eight, section. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Retrofire. The first solid fuel rocket should have gone. Twenty-five hundred pounds of thrust. In five and a half seconds, the second rocket should take over. On the re-entry of Gemini 6, these oh, rockets quiet on the line. did not fire automatically. There was a slight pause in the automatic fire, and Shira had to trigger. Borman confirms manually. retros have fired. And there it is, the confirmation. The retro rockets have fired, and Spacecraft 7 is and on the way back. retros fired. It has slowed down so that... The balance point LHC between... He says we're standing by for IVIs. And let's, let's listen as Frank Borman calls it out. Retro jet. Roger, retro jet. Seven. Houston, would you confirm the IVI readouts again? Those are the velocity readouts. Inertial right, velocity. Right, 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 right. Roger, very good. Very good from the ground. Presumably confirmation that the retro rockets fired on time, in sequence, and uh, at the proper power so that the velocity of the spacecraft in the, is meeting its pre-calculated velocity to... That was Jim Lovell calling out those incremental velocity indicator readings. And they are uh, right on the nominal. They brought some big smiles here in the control center in the face of Chris Kraft, Deke Slate, and others standing here monitoring this conversation. We're keeping the line open uh, to Houston, to Mission Control, and the voice of Germany Control, Paul Haney. Is, uh Gemini 7's altitude at that at the time of retro fire would have been uh, about 157 miles high. At a point on the equator about 3,000 
east southeast, 3,000 miles east southeast of the Philippines. They're due to reach the 400,000 foot mark at 49 and a half minutes after the hour. At that time, they'll be over the Rio Grande River, about 300 miles northwest of Monterey, Mexico.